Yeah, I have to sort of bump the theme song. I can't really play it because copyright issues, you know. Oh, yes, folks, happy Star Wars Day. Today is May the 4th be with you. So I thought I'd make this video basically explaining why most of you people who attack George Lucas are dead wrong about him. A couple of YouTubers have already mentioned this, but apparently Disney seems to think that they own the rights to the hashtag May the 4th be with you. Uh, <laughs> Disney, you are aware that hashtags are public domain, right? You don't own everything. At least the franchise is back in safe hands, as I said in my last video. And yeah, to all you Lucas haters, F you, I'm right, you're wrong. Sure, maybe he was the guy who gave us Jar Jar Binks. But you know what? Without George Lucas, I don't think you'd have this universe to begin with. <clears throat> Remember, Lucas started his career off with Francis Ford Coppola. Together they had worked on a movie called The Rain People in which Lucas had an uncredited uh, AD list. Um, it was not a big hit, of course, although it was critically a big hit. And then they would also do THX 1138. And, well, Warner Brothers did not understand that film, so they ended up cutting funding for future projects. And the two parted ways. I think what many also fail to grasp is that George Lucas does have a really good sense of humor. See what I mean, folks? It's the strangest thing I've ever heard. I know all the complaints against George Lucas, but you know these days I tend to just dismiss them because I don't think they're very legitimate. They're certainly not justified. Well, the prequel trilogy is not, never has been, and never will be considered a masterpiece like the originals. At least they were films that tried. And, well, this also played, of course, to the limits of Lucas's abilities as a writer. And you must keep in mind that no one was a harsher critic of Lucas's writing than George Lucas himself. I know this is something that gets a lot of hate thrown in his direction, and why these stormtroopers look a little pissed. Um, it's just something I'd like you to keep in mind. George's greatest weakness as a director, though, was he wasn't really an actor's director. Special effects, he knew. Stories, he knew. Good chemistry with actors, that was a bit of a stretch, even though he genuinely got along with everyone. But he wasn't really much of a director, and I think that was with the problem with the prequels. They didn't play to the strengths of George Lucas, the writer, or the director. If you have a problem with 90s and aughts George Lucas, well, then you really should have a problem with 70s and 80s George Lucas as well. The common complaints against Lucas are... Lucas surrounds himself with yes-men. This could easily be seen in Return of the Jedi. Howard Kazanjian probably offered the least resistance to any of George's ideas. Howard Kazanjian, who worked on Return of the Jedi, he probably offered the least resistance to any of George's ideas, other than the title of Return of the Jedi, which he thought was a weak title. So for the time being, it was Revenge of the Jedi. If anything, really, Kazanjian became Lucas's number one yes-man on the set of Jedi. To come to think of it, I don't even know if he offered any resistance to the Ewoks. I do know that everyone else on the set did. Rick McCollum probably questioned Lucas on more things, but he didn't want to overstep his authority. Well, because he didn't want to be out of a job. But he'd worked with Lucas since the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, and even was very concerned about how Jar Jar Binks would go over with fans. I think internally, he probably regretted not questioning George on some of the things that he was worried about. Lucas did better work when he had limited time and resources. To some degree, that might be true. You see, he was afraid that the original Star Wars was going to be terrible based on the limited technology and also the various weather problems that he had run into while filming it. But that's what really got at him. He was terrified the thing would be a failure. Also, of course, now he had all this technology at his disposal, and even that was still kind of limiting. Lucas can't write anymore? No, well, he never could. Like I said, it was not his strength as a filmmaker. In fact, 
It was actually Harrison Ford's idea to have River Phoenix play the young Indy. Well, because he reminded him so much of him at that age, and he had played Harrison's son in Mosquito Coast. But it was a fully realized backstory that set a lot within its limited time, which I think the entire backstory ran for only 10 minutes. But yeah, you saw where Indy got the scar on his chin, where he got the whip, the hat, all of it. So again, George Lucas was capable of very good ideas, even if a lot of you don't see it. And based on the success of the film, well, George Lucas wanted to tell more backstory on Indiana Jones. The success of Last Crusade would eventually lead to the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles for television. Um, unfortunately, the show did not manage to survive its planned four-year run, lasting only two seasons. But Lucas did have a lot more stories in mind far beyond its two-year run. But with the prequels, Nobody was really experienced at anything they were doing. They'd never really focused that much on effects, not quite like these. And also, Lucas was, well, while he was trying to find the right writers to help him focus the story, many others just encouraged, them to, encouraged him that he ought to do it himself. In fact, it was actually Coppola himself who convinced George Lucas that a good writer had to be a good director. But Lucas had always been very iffy about his skills as a director. You see, he kind of approached directing from more of, well, a sort of old English style. Kind of cold and, well, not really interfacing much with the actors. This does not mean he was a bad director. It's just that he had his own style. Whereas Spielberg's style as a director was, I don't want to use the word touchy-feely, but... He basically knew how to communicate with his actors better. Alan Dean Foster, who ghostwrote the first Star Wars film, also would write the first novelization, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, which initially was going to be the plot for what would eventually become The Empire Strikes Back. And, of course, Willard and Gloria Hike also helped shape up some of the dialogue that Lucas knew was weak in the first film. And, of course, as everybody knows, Kasdan did the scripts for Empire and Jedi. Lucas wanted to get the best talents that he possibly could because he was so adamant about not directing the sequels, and he definitely did not want to have to write them. So, no, not every decision Lucas made was good. But then again, not every decision was bad, either. So I hope this look has shown... Hold on a second. Mike, please action. So I hope this look has shown that when you basically put all of that together, the good decisions that Lucas has made weighed by the bad decisions that Lucas has made, it's pretty clear to see that George was a man of vision and passion. And quite frankly, I think the former far outweighs the latter. So may the fourth be with you and I will see you all later.